In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, uh, there's a tremendous description of the great men and women of God that walked with God throughout the Old Testament period from Abraham and onward. And these were great men and women like David, like Abraham, like Joseph, um, who pursued the Lord, who saw something in front of them. They saw the kingdom of God coming back into the world and they desired, though they had never experienced it, they had tasted and they were reaching out for it. And so in this description in the 11th chapter, <clears throat> um, the author gets to the place where he summarizes what it was about their lives in pursuit of God that he wants us to understand and have in our own lives. And he says, beginning in verse 13, <clears throat> all of these people died in faith without receiving the promises but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles upon the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, had they been thinking about and mindful of the country from which they came out, they would have had plenty of opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Praise the Lord. God has a better place for you and for me. He has a better life for us. He has a better purpose for us. If I asked you to think this morning about one thing, one activity, one thing that you could do that would draw God into your life, that would draw the Holy Spirit into your life, what would that one thing be? Think about it for a moment. What's the one thing, if you could only pick one, that would draw God, draw the Spirit of God into your life? Somebody might say, <clears throat> well, praying. Praying will bring God into my life. And somebody else might say, believing, faith, faith in God's Word. All great things, all things we should be doing. That would bring God into my life. Somebody would probably say, um, making right choices. Doing the right things, doing good things, making right choices. All those things are good. But guess what? None of those things without the one thing will actually bring God into your life anymore. God has a better place for you. He has a better life, a better purpose. And the key for you to enter into that place is desire. Desire is the one thing that makes everything else work. And without desire, nothing else works. God uses desire to get you and I from into the place that we're supposed to be in. And just wanting to be in his will, just wanting to be in the place that God has for you is not enough to get you there. Uh, uh, um, just believing in it, I'm sorry. Just believing that God has a place for you and accepting it isn't enough to get you there. You have to want it. And David in Psalm 27 said, One thing have I desired, and that also will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and inquire in his holy temple and see the beauty of the Lord. David had pared things down in his life. David was obviously a man of many desires. He was kind of a renaissance man of his time. But when it came right down to it, David said, I have really one quantifying, all-consuming desire, and that is the Lord and to be in his holy temple, to be in his presence. And he said, that also will I pursue. That also will I be after. In our text that we opened up with in Hebrews, it says all these people live their lives reaching forward to have what God had purposed for them. And they died in faith, face down in the dirt, with their arms stretched out, reaching, having never really received what God had for them, but they died in faith believing for it. 
What was the one thing that God said, those are my people. I'm not ashamed of them, and I have prepared a city for them. You know, though they did great things in their life, great exploits, they were faithful, all those things counted for something. But the one thing that made God say, it will not be, um, it will not be a wasted effort. I will bring them into what I have for them, as the Bible says, they desired a better country. It was their desire that attracted God to their life. And it was their desire that made God say, I'm not ashamed of them. These are my people. Without a focused, consuming desire, there is no moving forward in God. You can pray, you can believe, you can do all the things the Bible says to do, but God is looking for desire. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 6 and 21, where your treasure is, that will your heart be also. The Lord Jesus and his kingdom are all about presenting God's love to the world and seeing who has desire. Who does it matter to? A lot of people want to be right. They want to be in the right church. They want to be in the right thing. They want to belong to the right organization. They don't want to be wrong. Um, but that in and of itself is not desire. Desire is an all-consuming passion of the heart that leads, and that is the thing that God is looking for. Knowing and accepting God's purpose for your life isn't enough to get you there. You can know it. You can believe in it, but you must desire his purpose and make it your own. You've got to want it as much as God wants it. You've got to want what God wants. It is your desire that matches you up with his desire for you. Jesus didn't come and do the things that he did, ultimately culminating in his laying down his life on the cross because he wanted to show the world a correct example, because he wanted to make a distinction between light and darkness and evil and righteousness. It was one thing that motivated Jesus. It was desire. We know it in the most popular verse of the Bible. For God so loved the world. It was not an abstract feeling. It was not a sterile act of righteousness. It was a passionate desire. God so loved the world, it moved him from his throne in glory to the stable of Bethlehem, eventually to Calvary's cross. It was desire that was praying through our Savior in the garden. It was desire that the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, gave birth to the church. It was desire that caused God to reach out and draw you to himself. And you didn't come until you desired what God desired for you. And that's how we walk with him. Your desire, your desire is the key to moving with God. Mark eleven twenty four 24, again, there's so many verses that bring this out. This is one popular, familiar to all of us. But listen, listen carefully to what Jesus says. Therefore I say to you, what things soever you when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. We concentrate on believing. We concentrate on having faith, having the right faith, believing accurately according to the scriptures. But the thing that Jesus is concentrating on is the thing that prefaced faith. He said, what things soever you desire when you pray. Prayers of faith fall short of receiving their answers, not for a failure of faith, but for a lack of desire. God knows that your desire is only partial, and that if that answer holds out just long enough, you'll give it up, and you'll go set your desire on something else. David said, one thing have I desired, I will not be satisfied with anything else. Do you remember the cry of Rachel? Give me children, or else I die. That's desire. That moves God. Somebody say, praise the Lord. You know, faith and prayer and all other activities that unite you with God must be fueled by your desire in order to work in your life. 
How many of us have gone through patches in our life where it said, prayer's not working for me? Faith doesn't seem to be full of joy. For some reason, all the different things that I do as a Christian that, that, that uh, creates a context of my fellowship with God just seem to be stale, seem to be dead. I'm in a, we like to call it a desert place. I'm in a desert place. And you're wondering what happened. I'll tell you right now what happened. 100% of the time, something happened to your desire. It's one thing to want circumstances to ease up, to change. It's another thing to have desire for God. Desire for God, when it wanes, when it drops, when it backs off, your faith suffers, prayer suffers. All of the various ways in which you pursue God suffer. They eventually get set off to the side and other interests fill your focus and begin to lead your life. Desire is the eye of your heart. With desire, or excuse me, I should say without desire. Without desire, we're blind to the things of God. It's desire that enables you to see what God wants you to have. People that are only mildly interested in Jesus, mildly interested in God, for whatever their motivations might be, never really see the things of the kingdom. They never really see the things of God because desire is the eye of the heart. Your desire is what the Holy Spirit uses to provide you with focus, faith, and fortitude necessary to see and to receive and to do the things that God's ordained for you to do. Sitting passively and saying, I know God wants me to do this, or I know the Lord has called me to this place, and passively waiting for him to do it, you, we should by now know where that'll get you. It'll get you nowhere. And you could go to your grave saying, I knew I was supposed to do this. You don't want to arrive in heaven and realize there was a whole life waiting for you and you never really began to live the other half of it. What happened? Something interfered with your desire. This morning, the one point of my message is to provoke you to want to rehab your desire to recapture it, to shake it loose and free. Think of the Apostle Paul, marooned on that island after the shipwreck experience, warming himself over the fire, and the Bible says a serpent came out and fastened itself to its, his hand, and all of, the, all of the pagans stood back waiting for him to die because it was a poisonous serpent. But the Bible says he didn't die, and he shook the serpent off in the fire. Many vipers have fastened themselves to your life and their venom entering your bloodstream has one target, your desire in your heart. Poison your desire, weaken your desire, and we need to shake those serpents off. We need to make desire the one indispensable pursuit of our life. Desire for God. God will show up in your life when you truly desire Him, and He will provide everything else. The Holy Spirit will cause faith and prayer to come back to life when you desire the Lord more than anything else. Hallelujah. You know, <clears throat> I've noticed that Satan doesn't really put up much of a fight to keep people from learning about God's plan for them. <clears throat> I mean, the internet, the television, it used to be before when everyone watched TV, churches all over the place, that the plan of God, the blessings of God, the devil has not been very successful. I personally don't think he's tried real hard to, to, to stop people from finding out about God's plan for them. And there's a reason why. He hasn't put his hard fight into keeping people from finding out. Matter of fact, um, 
He doesn't really fight churches keeping the doors open and letting people file in week after week and just be reinforced and learn about God's plan for them. He waits, he holds back, and he saves his real fight, his real battle for the area that he knows he always has and always will until Jesus returns be able to win his battles. And that area is the human heart robbing the heart that knows the purpose of God, knows there's a vision, knows there's a plan, robbing the human heart from, desi from the desire. Because he knows that by overwhelming the hearts of people with difficulties and with diversions, they will set aside their desire and pursuit for God. That's how he can win. There are millions of cars parked with half or full tanks of gas that are not going to go anywhere, barely going to start up. They're just sitting there waiting to fulfill their purpose. Millions of Christians parked in churches, hearts filled with the knowledge of God. They have learned things a thousand times over, but they've only attained small portions of what they have heard. They are waiting for a Kesara Sera God. They're waiting for a God of happenstance. They've been taught somehow that, that if God wants to do something, He'll do it. That if God has a will for your life, He'll bring it to pass. We blame God for our lack of progress. We blame God for our lack of spiritual maturity. We blame, blame God for our lack of fullness. Yet the Bible makes abundantly clear over and over and over again that the people who broke away from the crowd reached into their hearts and came up with their own desire and passion to pursue God. They are the ones that God provided a city for. They are the ones whose names were written in the hallmark of faith of the 11th chapter of Hebrew, of which God said, because they desired a better country, all of those feats, Joseph, honoring God in a foreign land, in a prison, didn't go from the prison to being prime minister of the empire because it was God's will. He did it because he would not let go of his desire. His desire when he was young and impetuous got him into trouble with his brothers. They couldn't stand him. His impish little personality and he was obnoxious about it. How many people got saved and the first sign in their life was obnoxiousness? A lot of believers get saved first thing they become is obnoxious. But what is that? That is in the rough. That is undeveloped passion and desire. Somehow in the refining process we allow our, dis our, our uh, pencil to be sharp until there isn't one anymore. We allow our desire to be refined until it doesn't exist. Don't let Satan rob desire for God out of your heart. Because that's usually all it takes to get zealous Christians to simmer down and settle far below God's place for them in their life. Proverbs 4.23, another popular verse. Simple. Guard your heart with all diligence. Let me say it like this. Guard your desire with all diligence above all that you guard, for it determines the course of your life. Let me say it again. Guard your desire with all diligence, for that determines the course of your life. Don't like the way your life's going? Waiting for your life to kick start, start over again, take a higher road, take a higher path? Waiting isn't going to get you there. Believing God has a higher road for you, not going to get you there. Going to a church that preaches every week to you, encouraging words about your authority and purpose, not going to get you there. All of those things are simply helpers of the one thing you can't live without, and that is your own desire. The biggest trouble a Christian can be in is not moral compromise. It's lack of desire. You know, 
The world has become a great slippery slope today. People are sliding and falling into the most perverse and, and ridiculous things. And more and more, the church is accommodating uh, the corruption of the world. And, you know, everybody's running around with their hair on fire and alarmed about it. Well, we should be alarmed. God has always been, is today, and always will be a holy God. Sin will always be sin. Immorality will always be immorality. There'll never be a time in history where immorality is okay. And there certainly will never be a time like there was in the Old Testament where God winked at those things, so to speak. But now the Bible says he commands everyone everywhere to repent. But let me tell you something. As awful as those traps are, there's something far worse that you cannot recover from than being compromised morally. And that is to have your desire corrupted and to have it paralyzed. Because when your desire is paralyzed, you can't do anything except go get your desire back, which is where we're going this morning. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Guard your heart with all diligence. Guard your desire because it determines the course of your life. Don't let Satan use your desires for the world to crowd out your desire for God and the things of God. Most of you here are not teenagers or in your 20s. I can, I, I'm not that sharp, but I can figure that out. And so that means most of you have lived long enough to realize that you only have so much room in your heart. The heart is not eternal. The heart can only be filled with so much, and then it's got to offload stuff. Now, we all know that. Just think about it in your life. You push things out when you find something new and shiny, something else you want to pursue. You only have enough room for just so much emotion, so much commitment, so much interest, so much passion in your life. And when you find something, when you hook that really big fish, all of the forces of your being are marshaled and come into play to try to bring that thing in. And so don't play that game with yourself. That you could be a man or a woman of the world and you could go out and sort of just embellish your heart with all kinds of things because you believe in Jesus and because you're a Christian and you love the Lord somewhere down in your heart and think that you're going to actually cross that finish line with a well done, good and faithful servant waiting for you because it's not going to happen. I don't want to come rolling up with the last wave on heaven's shore, huffing and puffing, half dead, my scales rubbed off, barely making it, to crawl onto the shore and stand up and realize that God had a life of biblical proportion waiting, but I was never interested enough, passionate enough to go out and get it. Somebody say praise the Lord. You know, I, when I worked all this out, you know, in my heart, and prayed over and everything, I heard a lot more preaching back to me. I heard a lot more, amen, but, you know, it's all right. Maybe, maybe you're engrossed. Uh, it could be. So there's a psalm. I love this one. Psalm 145, verse 19. Listen to this. God satisfies the desire of his loyal followers. God satisfies the desire of what? The people that pray the most? God satisfies the desire of the people that read the Bible the most? It might sound like I'm minimizing or trivializing these things. I hope you know that I'm not. But I'm just so tired of seeing Christians spinning their wheels, spending time, pouring more energy. I'm, I'll just need to pray more. Need to, when, they're pro, when they're doing it with a quarter tank of desire in their heart, none of those works about how good they are are going to get you any further than you are right now in your life. Desire is like magic fuel. You can be here one minute and desire will put you right there. All of a sudden, you don't have to try to pray. You can't stop praying. 
All of a sudden, you don't have to set aside a time to read the Word. You're, you've got the thing on the dashboard of your car, and you're, you're checking out the Word of God all the time. You're thinking about it. So everything else is like a dead wagon when that horse, that ox of desire comes along. It just hitches up everything, and it just moves you along in your life. It's fantastic. It's just wonderful. It's so easy when you let desire become the thing that guides and leads you. I'm going to kind of bring this thing in for a landing because I want us to respond this morning. I want to have plenty of time to do that, but um, can I say to you today that God is proud of people of faith who passionately desire for him to take them to a better place. That's what that opening verse said. God's proud of them. He said, I'm not ashamed to be called their God. Have you ever thought of God being proud? Well, if the Bible says he's a father, of course he's proud. What father isn't proud of their children? What father also sometimes is ashamed of his children? He doesn't love them any less, but he's disappointed that he can't do more in their life than he wanted to do. What is it that makes God proud? He said it right there in Hebrews. He is not ashamed to be called their God. Why? They desired a better country. And the they that they're talking about were people that left Egypt. They left the places in their life where they had been living a half baked life, and they went out into desert places. They went out into journeys. They um, underwent trouble and persecution because they were following something in their vision. The whole story of Abraham is all about a man that was driven with desire. Desire is the motivating force for the Holy Spirit. You want more of the Holy Spirit moving in your life? It begins with desire. It's great to fast, great to pray, all of those things, but truly, you set your heart back on fire with the desire for God. And let me tell you, it won't take having to set aside a fasting schedule. And I'm not, again, I'm not minimizing fasting. I fast regularly, but... It won't be that maintenance program that gets you where God wants you to be. It'll be your desire for him. Why? Because he is reaching down to you with desire. Desire meets desire. 1 Peter chapter 2, I'll close with this, says, like newborn babes, you must crave the pure spiritual milk, so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Like I said to you, God's got a better life. He's got a better country, a better place, better purpose. And he goes on. You must crave the pure spiritual milk so that you can grow into a full experience of salvation. Therefore, cry out for this nourishment. I'll just sit in your crib, and say, if God wants me to have it, he'll drop a bottle on me. The Bible says, cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Our children certainly cried out for that, that nourishment. So he says, like babes. He's not saying we're all babes. But here's our altar call. Let me set it up for you this morning. Um, though Christians may have been saved for many years, most believers do not mature much beyond the experience of their infancy because their desire to experience the things of a spirit-filled life become replaced with desire to simply have God's blessing on their natural life. We have been given a pass by our pastors. And in many books that we've read and just the experiences of life, we have bought the idea that things are good if my life is blessed. I just simply desire that God would bless my natural life. 
with peace and with joy, and I will live as a witness for Jesus. Listen, that is wonderful, certainly better than living the life of a sinner. But the desire to have a blessing on your natural life will supplant, displace, replace, and overthrow the passionate, all-consuming desire to truly have a spirit-filled life. And some of you are listening to this this morning and you're probably sitting there thinking, you know, this is true. And I haven't thought about this in a long time. I've been happy week by week to just simply stay saved, <laughs> stay relevant. But this is a call this morning to stand up and to begin to pursue the purpose for which God sent Jesus to pursue us because our world today needs a kind of disciple that's going to be more than a churchgoer and someone who just stands up and says, well, I'm a Christian. I don't believe in those things. We need people who literally are installations of the kingdom of God upon the earth. It takes desire. And so if you'll close your Bibles or turn off your Bible app and your devices, we're going to shift gears from hearing this exhortation to acting upon it.